Chapter 1 The Deep, Deep Dark Shadows They Lose Their Power In the Day At least the ones that sneak into your room after the sun fades, watching you from the corners and the space in between. The creeper that Libby calls them only go from home to the dark place where the sun rises once again, replacing the cold stare of the moon. You can feel the creepers watching from the dark branches above them. It felt wrong to her, like staying up on the bedtime while hiding your green bees in a napkin. They walked deeper into the woods. She held her mother's hand, gripping it tightly until they made it to the clearing. Libby let out a sigh as the sun found her cheek. She knew the walk was only temporary. Isn't this a bad place, Mummy? Libby asked. The one you told me never to come to. High grass tickled her legs. They pushed further into the open field. She wasn't expecting an adventure that morning. The promise of frosted cupcakes was all you could get to, to, to get her to come along. Grabbing Miss Sally, her favourite doll, she and her mother left the house early and they headed across town. Yes, we're fine, Libby. We won't be long, her mother said, giving a small smile as she glanced around the woods. They found a nice flat spot in the field. Grass had been pushed down, probably a idea of making a bed for the night. Libby thought her dad taught her but back when he was still alive with them, they all take walks in the woods. You find out all the kind of neat things. Her mum never said much when she tagged along on his adventures, which wasn't often. He missed her day. It was getting harder and harder to remember his face. Her mum had living a wicker basket. He walked from home. When she spread the blanket, well, she spread the a blanket across the ground. It was warm, well, warmer than usual, being so close to Halloween. Her mum called it an Indian summer, or something like that. Libby lifted a little basket, sneaking a peek to make sure the promised goodies were inside, celebrating the function. And went the whole way to her brain, she smiled, remembering her mum to take, make the treat before Daddy came home from work. She flopped down on the corner of the blanket. Look up, Kate, very ready in her hand. Not yet, her mum said, taking her finger around. Give it here. The mother took the first little treat. Placed it on the stack for the others in the She added a couple of juice boxes from the basket. Dewey knew they wasn't far home. It seemed like they'd been traveling for days. But he rumbled and couldn't really taste the blueberry fruit drink waiting for her end of, uh, on the end of the blanket. Something smells funny, he said. Smells bottom. And one more the toilet paper from the side of the straw, piercing it through the top of the drink bottle. We're in the woods, Debbie. They're all sort of funny smells out here. Libby took a slow, long step. The cold liquid ran all the way down the throat into her belly. It felt good. She reached for one of the cupcakes, but paused. Something cracked in the woods at the edge of the clearing. Libby jumped to her knees. What was that? she said. Just an animal, probably a squirrel, her mum said. When... But she was up to her knees too, looking around. Well, what if it's a bear? Libby asked. She heard stories of bears coming to town, eating from trash. They found one sleeping in a park. Her mother stood up, staring at the spot in the distance. Libby tried to follow their her eyes. Something flashed between the trees like glass, reflecting in the sun. What was that? Libby st- stood up, grabbing a handful of her mother's dress. Her mother pleated the top of it, patted the top of her head. It's a friend of mine. I need to go and talk to her for a minute. Okay, I'm coming. Libby re- reached up down for a drink and to grab a cupcake for a trip within a trip. My mum smiled and knelt down back to her. You can't come with me. Mum needs to see her friend for herself. Why not? I'll be quiet, promise. My mum dropped her finger into the ice in the cake of Libby's hand. It's a secret meeting. Is that, that, is that Santa? Libby gasped, smudging the ice on the end of her nose. Mum off. it's not Santa, but I'm sure he's watching. So I need to get, you'd be a good girl and stay right here until Mummy gets back. But, no buts, the smile disappeared from her mother's face. You do not, I mean, do not leave this blanket until I get back, understood? Yes, Mummy, good, I'll be right back. Eat the cupcakes, but leave, save a couple for me, okay? Let me smell the fussing smears on the top of her nose. Okay, 
Like some other across the field, hey, you took the trees, shot a white envelope from her pocket, and carried it to her hands. So it was Santa's meeting after all. She would, uh, must should have just told him he was a couple of presents he could have added to the list. At the end of the end of the woods, her mum turned away, maybe way back, and watched as they disappeared in the dark land of the green boots. Maybe found a soft spot in the middle of a blanket and bit into a cup plate. Crumbs carelessly dropping to her lap. It was very, very bit as delicious as she imagined it. She felt the same cold chill she felt before the woods. In the woods, she crept up on her, up her neck and she shivered. The sun was shining higher over the trees while her mother had just vanished. A breeze blew across the field. She felt the goosebumps on her arms. The rotten smell returned, mixing with the fussy still on the end of her nose. She winced. It, sm- it smelt stronger, closer. She stared at the glass around her. She saw something in the glass, something a few feet away from her. Something red. It painted the, painted the ground it leaves, and the leaves around it. She crawled across the blanket, inching closer to the serious red spot. It's thick and sticky and a puddle on the ground. She knew better than reach out and touch it. Something told her not to. She found a stick and used it to move close, move to the sort of glass away. Most of the glass away, but that's when the buzzing started. Lily never saw so many flies before in her life. It darted back around the glass. Tony its army echoed in her ears. A loud little voice at the back of her head told her to stop. Just go back to the cupcakes. Of course, she was stronger than her fear. She pushed the rest of the glass back to the side. Even first, the tangled blood of fur confused her, but it's the size of a rabbit. At least she thought it was. She, she, she thought the process it looked like someone turned it and turned it out. Mummy! She stood up, stood up and looked across the field. She's nowhere in sight. Mummy! She called it in. Instead of Mummy's voice, something growled back of somewhere inside the field. Libby dropped down to the blanket, held her breath, listening for Mrs. Sally pressed tight against her chest. The growling stopped. The field was quiet again, except for the buzzing from the new friends nearby. She wasn't looking at the grass again. She was too afraid. Her mum said she would only be gone a few a minute. She'd be back any second. They'll eat, they'll eat their cupcakes and leave. She wouldn't have to think about the woods or the creepy woods anymore. Something pushed through the glass in the distance. She heard the snap of twigs in the glass, hissing it as it moved closer to her. Tears welled in her eyes. Maybe it was her mum went back. It had to be. The noise grew louder, coming from all around her, like it was circling her, inching closer. Reached past mum. She didn't care who heard. Not anyone. She, need, she just needed her mum back with her on the blanket. A low, gruntled growl blew in from the field behind her. It's okay, Miss Sally. Mum is coming back, she promised. A cloud drifted in the sky above her, passing in front of the sun. A shadow moved from in, slowly crossing the clearing. Dark, alone, terrified, Libby clung to her doll, moving in small circles to make it, trying to follow the horrible sound as it grew nearer. It stopped, the tall weeds shook, but the field was alive, and something crept straight towards her. The smell had been from dead on her, and the field and usher, the flies stopped buzzing. The sea of grass parted in front of her, the eyes of the blood red her. Evil, oh, pure evil, stared back at her, and Libby knew the creepers had found her. Libby! A mum sprinted out of the woods and said, and back from the field, Baby, she put in a circle, the grass trying to remember. Where the blanket was. Where are you? It's Mama. Tall, look, tall tails of a great cloud past the field, taking the shadow, make shadows of it. She attracted her footmarks, but it was more than just her. A living mark pushing down the glass. This isn't funny now, baby. I'll answer your mother. Full panic set in. The kind, only apparent of a lost child who can know. She sprinted aimless towards the middle of the field. She saw the black clear wall clearing, a cover of blanket, a rush of relief flooded over her. Mum was here, something wrapped around her ankle as she ran. She threw her hands in front of her, trying to catch herself as she fell, but it happened too fast. 
hit a head thumped against a rock, jutting from the ground. Pain shot down her spine. She could feel the warm ooze of blood trickling across her forearm. Her vision blurred as she pulled herself up and saw a bloody carcass lying next to her. Fear froze her in place. She wanted to look back, but her eyes couldn't wouldn't let her. So the first breath wouldn't come down back to her until she realised the fur had been stripped away from the carcass. Whatever it was, had been dead for a while. Baby days. Baby Libby found it too. Maybe that's why she left. Standing up, she tried to control the shaking of her voice. It's okay, Libby. Mummy's here. Let's finish our picnic. Looking down, she realised the banquet was still on the ground. Libby drank the spill, staining the crisscross pattern. Okay. The basic lid was open. Bending down, she noticed another stain. Thick and red, trailing off of the grass. At the edge of the blanket was Miss Sally, miraculously half of Miss Sally. The doll had been torn in two. Falling into her knees, she cried out into the empty woods, a dark, deep, dark woods around her. Libby! Chapter 2. Welcome home, Ethelyn Jones. Ethelyn read the headline. Search for the missing girl continues. He ran his fingers across the front of the newspaper, not really sure what he expected to happen. Answers through a lot of doubtful. Probably just another more questions. He has to feel he's had to feel those. You okay, pal? The park last one. He's stuck in the potato rack, drip rack. Boy, he stared with a mixture of great and other wacko. Why has always got to be on my shift? It wasn't the first time Elfin was the receiving end of that look. He dropped the newspaper closely, moving out of the freezer with it inside a small conveyance store. What was the chance they carried his favourite end brain? energy drink. Got any great brain scrape? Everything asked. What you see is what you got. Potato to chip guy. Never even looked up. Truck comes on for Tuesday. Elfin has no plan to being around that long. So was literally the last stop before he hit the rumors bill. He needed to fuel up both mechanically and physically. The mini mark wasn't even on the map the last time he was around. Of course, that was over a decade ago. Still he's glad to spot it on the way. Sure, it's, it's stolen. him. But could, who could blame him? His hand has been shaking, all for the last 20 miles. Sadly, for his over caffeine backed up beverage, burst of blaster, he, he shifted over to the stack arm. It's better than some zinkies. Bought him a psycho pastry on the top shelf. He made his way to the front corner. Of course, church guy was obvious. Bit of all. Still focusing on his display. Who what did he think he was? It's a fiasco. A perturbed chip of his place. I'm ready, I'm ready up here, Elvis said, but he tried not to sound like too much of an asshole. With just the right amount of amount of irritated, Jerk stopped at least three more bags of chips before checking something on the frozen drink machine for meandering up the front. He went and sprinkled in a little more asshole than he thought. Moving far didn't seem a real high priority with small town living. Something Elfin seemed to have forgot after moving away to the city. After well, after the well, the event, his first therapist called it. But during their sessions, it sounded less ominous. The future employee of the month grabbed a drink on the counter, scanning it with one of those handheld things that reminded Elfin of some cheesy sci-fi weapon. Life expectations set to low. A bell above the door chimed as a couple of guys boomed in the store, all of them were late teens, maybe early twenties. The first guy was straight, built ball cap, but Steve usually cantered to the side, found the need to announce their arrival. Stigma Delta in the house. Lord help them. Elfin just called for a pull the front row seat. The next episode of the facts had gone bad. A group all burst into deep, gut wrenching, black snapping laughter. Not that way over the top for such a pathetic joke. The same line they probably used every time they walked in the same place. It meant either two things, they were stupid or they were drunk. Knowing his luck, he probably combination of both. On his school, proved enough to have a struggle for Elfin, and the college never seemed to fit for him. His aunt didn't have the kind of money. Well, of course, he never fitted them. They raised to raise him from the time. It's an either. She's a good one. He took him in when no one else would. Still, he sometimes wondered what he had done with a college degree in the back pocket, where his life had taken him. One of the frat brothers, 
pointed to the stump of a stump of a cashier brought behind the counter. His face lit up like he just thought found one of the Beatles. Malt, he pointed out his chip eye grin, wondering, is our main man Malt? The group chanted in semi unison. They made their way back to the corner. Malt, 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 the little look leaned out of the counter, speaking just loud enough for Elvin to hear. It's Milt, you morons. Well, good for you, Milt. A little sarcasm goes a long way. Maybe there's still hope for this one. Yet Milt rang the eyes of them. As Elfin handed him his bank card, the party raged in the back of the store, eventually making its way to the front. The fat stooges banged on two thirty packs of, on the counter. Maybe one more, one of them asked. Nah, sixty beers, four of us. That's like tilted pack. Dude took a pong pong, fifty in a piece. He said that out before he even realised he said it. He made you regret his decision. You could hear the world of trash come back to come closing in around him and someone whispering in his ear. It's a trap. Dude, you go to school. Do you go to school and just pass it through I've been answered, trying to figure out what which response was the result, at least from out of conversation. Yeah, I kind of figured. Look a little old, said the old man that guy quit. No offense, bro. Elfin smiled back at him. None taken, bro. Apparently, the room is real community. Charlie's gone, gone, had quite a growth spurt. While Elfin was away, he made a couple of buildings outside the town where his kid, most of the classes, was centered around archaeological engineering or something like judging the RMC. See, and they were across t shirts. The one guy retorted, they definitely expanded. He had a hard time thinking of his old stumping grounds as college at town. I'm going to need some ID, Malt. Malt, chip guy, waved Elfin's card at him. Elfin watched some late night news special years ago that suggested asking for ID on the back of your bank card, hoping you from getting defrauded. He thought it was Santa's other the day. As any every, that was until every other store clerk started asking for identification. He handed over his license. Elfin, Elf, Oswald, Elfin Jones. I can't say I heard that one before. Bill handed it back. Oh no, he just had to read it aloud. Elfin knew exactly what was, where this headed. Trim, straight brimmed household, Nick, as hat. Next to him, didn't miss a beat. Well, when his name is Elfin, do you? That's Elfin's awesome. Ah, oh, so being told very repeatedly. Elfin's grandfather, I oh, love it, sorry, Elfin Fraser Fitzgerald Hughes, a man that he never met, was a caretaker of Rumor in Cemetery back in the 50s, a quiet man and politely adored his job, apparently, be- probably because he was the only employee that really ever, back, ever talked back to him. His mother wanted some piece of his family heritage to live in a uh, new child. So the lovely blessed his granddaughter's name, Oswald, came from his great grandfather. Maybe more like one than sister that Frank or maybe Joe. Hell, they even take a Chad. Well, maybe not Chad. Elfin tried pushing a less offensive Uzi for a little while back in grade school, but it was never caught on. Eventually some teacher would call out his full name a public dis- Suddenly he's conceded in the One of the fat guys pointed at the newspaper counter. Hey, that's a shame. A little veil from some pervert probably snatched you up. I heard from the mum something to do with it. No, and it. But we do, wouldn't doubt it. The supreme arse hat said people are effing missing up. He said, Belton and stuff. So I get it. Yeah, I saw how you slipped that in there. Arsehole hat magic was right about one thing, you know. People are definitely missed up. So Elfin's curiosity was peaked. People think the girl's mum did it. Why else would she have that girl out? Why would she leave have the girl out in the middle of the woods that raised both hands to accelerate the point? Like she was already having closer, closing arguments, a pending trial. Elfin chalked it up to town gossip and must have floated across Boone's counter over the last few days. The whole trip was probably just a few a big waste of time. Then, he thought about his sketchbook out in his truck and left his latest latest pit of arts arse up. His heart, he'd never been wrong yet. Still he could always hope. Grabbing a plastic bag off the counter, Elfin headed for the great seat. You guys will be careful tonight. Arse out Prime actually gave him a thumbs up. 
full moon tonight, bro. The holiday party is an efficient effect. We're going to party. Our lives depend on it. Last hat of our London held. Strange in the poor milk's face to separate the point. Let's hope he doesn't come to that. Help him not his way out. Hoping his truck, hoping he'd be in his truck outside. He yeah, unscrewed the top of his drink. He tried to get back in the sanctuary his own space. Did you get me something? Take a sip along the bottle. Never glance at his passenger. He left out coat of glass. That real glass he up in. Why well, some great master bars from his chin? Alfie smiled, not saying it wasn't. You would have to come in with me. I'm in the the car with Alfie Jettle. Like that matters. He handed out the bottle across the console. Touch console. He wants some of mine. Ha ah, ah, ha ah. ha. There's a community now, Wilson star. Stared at the bottle, dangling in front of him. Just trying to be light, Alfie put up the truck in reverse. Making his way out and back in the road. It's, it hit the console six, he put Alfie broke his silence. Clark back. There said maybe the mum has something to do with a missing girl, maybe with barking up the wrong tree. Wilson st- stared out the wind past the window. Well, it's enough. It's at least possible, Elfin said. He said it enough time, maybe it start to believe it too. And maybe I'll set you the whole set up whole stuttering duck comedian thing started. Wilson looked at me with his hands in there. Wacky, wacky, wacky. I don't think the world's ready for your stage presence. Tucci Mushi Fuchi. I don't know your French, French elfin not. That was French. Wilson put his arms across his chest. But sometimes I made myself. I well, was pretty empty in a time of night. Definitely one thing elfin did enjoy was the absence of bumper to bumper traffic. Battled every day in Philly. Lone pale headlights came at coming at easy a half a mile away. Elfin clicked on the radio trying to tune into a clear station. Not an easy task so far from the city. Twice of him to say the least. No against the rap. Wilson climbed, got ya. No country, I don't do bumping. Wilson found a 70 watt stage and cranked that move on him. You see with this, or I sing. Said, I'll take that behind the curtain number, Elfin. Watch out. Wilson pointed to a window, shooting his face with his arms. Hundreds of feet away, and straddling the yellow line at the oncoming lad by find the Elfin. He swerved the right to miss the colliding with the oncoming car. His tires balanced off the pavement. He felt like when the truck blew, wheels blew as soon as he hit the boom. The truck bounced off the road and the elfin had a hard time getting it back under control. He finally got all four wheels back and round and into the pavement. A mix of loud music and laughter echoed as the car barreled past them. Elfin stamped on his brakes, steadying, fighting to skidding to a stop in the middle of the road. Idiots, Elfin shouted out the window. He sat behind the wheel, waiting for his heart to slow down. Least in the city, what she was worried about? Maybe this was an omen. Town was sending them a message to turn around, forget the whole thing, and head home. It was hit the city limits. we almost had turned into Pete Road Pizza. He rested his head against the top of his steering wheel. You're not even going to ask if I'm okay, Wilson said, peering out from behind his arms. Probably more of the, the, the more of those college kids over the place. You know, oh, by the way, I'm fine, Wilson said. I know you're okay, but. Wilson protested, you're dead, Wilson. You can't get undead, remember? Out. Always back to the house, Wilson said. Still Patty, feeling the need to go quick, self as am. Puzzle with several injuries. Hey, I never asked the best friend of the ghost. Elfin put me, tell me, put the trucking gear and st- started down the road. It still could be a coincidence. That he'd never wrong before. The wrong before, Wilson added. Elfin looked down at his hand and then over to the sketchbook bridge between the seats. His dreams took a turn for the worse last week. Always a sign something bad was still coming. Still, a trip back to the town he grew up was the last thing in his calendar. He spent a lot of time, a lot of therapy hours, pressing the part of his life. The latest sketch tore open a lot of old wounds. He wasn't, oh, wasn't sure how he handled coming back here. There. I wonder if he's waiting for me. Elfin. Elfin, who? You know who, Elfin said. We saw a message on the headroom, didn't you? She said she can't wait to see you. Yeah, I know, but it's 15 years since I was at full back here. Elfin felt the old familiar lump tight his chest. Well, I think that's some kind of monster. What if I convince her that I am? I'm not that I'm a monster, I'm a human being. Wilson chimed, cutting his hands in front of her face. Come on, she's one of your best friends. If you get wasn't a girl, you probably better join the brain back then. 
you worry, you worry too much. I prefer just to be cautious. Don't be so frogged. You felt the same way three nights ago. You woke up screaming. During these dreams, let him sort of breath and cold and sweat. But never, but every, every once in a while, we got what he liked to call Grand Mill Nightmare. It shook him right to his core. His sketchbook was open, lying on the sheets next to him. He wouldn't even want to knock. He knew he didn't. But last time he had an episode that bad, it was the day before his aunt died. He didn't really have much of a choice, left he'd been busy. He didn't recognize the little girl on the page. She was crying in pain, surrounded by shadows with clothing around her. As disturbing as the image was, it really terrified Elfin with the eyes hidden in the shadows. Watched her almost as she was tight with prey. When he saw the news at night about the girl, went missing in the woods just outside the farm. He knew it wouldn't be a coincidence. How much further until we hit down, Elfin asked. Hey, maybe a poor choice of woods, considering. Wilson, about twenty minutes, Wilson answered. Pulling on his t shirt tighter on his chest and frigid chair with him. Could you put the window up? Oh, he didn't go off. Ghosts don't get you're such an arse. 